Hi, everyone. Uh, hi. <laughs> My name is Shirley Lee. I'm a staff writer at Entertainment Weekly, and I'm so excited to welcome you guys tonight to the conversation with the women behind Jessica Jones. Uh, so please welcome Jessica Jones herself, Kristen Ritter, and showrunner Melissa Rosenberg. <laughs> Hi guys, thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. <laughs> thanks for coming. <laughs> so I'd like to take a page from Jessica's book and say, let's start, start at, at the, the beginning. beginning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so rewinding all the way back to when your audition process started, Kristen, that was October 2014. You yes, good yeah. job. You, you did had your homework. I did my homework. I always do my homework. <laughs> You had come off of Don't Trust the Bee, which was gone yeah. too soon. And you've said before that you were constantly seeing kind of the same roles before you got this one. So what yeah. type of roles were you seeing? Not as good versions of Don't Trust the Bee. Mm -hmm. um, when that was canceled, I was so heartbroken and so devastated. I was crying and so devastated. Mm -hmm. And then I got an offer for something else like four days later. And I was like, it's not even cold yet. <laughs> Um, and it just, nothing was, it was as good, uh, but I was happy to have opportunities. Um, and it was just kind of like watered down versions of that. And it, I didn't want to repeat myself. Uh, I thought that part was so epic and so fun and I loved doing it. I wanted to find something that was like equally, um, impactful and equally challenging and fun for me, but the opposite spectrum, which is, um, I mean, Jessica Jones, <laughs> like literally the polar opposite of that role, but equally epic. Uh, well, even more epic, obviously. <laughs> no, right, exactly. I mean, you could retitle it, Don't Trust the Bee in uh, Hell's Kitchen. I don't know. Anyway, not a great joke. Um, but <laughs> moving on from that, I, <laughs> I am wondering, when you were pitched this show, I think you've said before that you heard that it was just a superhero series. Well, my, my manager, who we were just talking about backstage before <laughs> Kyle, um, my manager called me and said you know Marvel and Netflix are doing this superhero show it's about this superhero named Jewel and we looked up a photo of her and I was like well what do you mean I, I, obviously I'm not gonna get that oh no what he said was uh, she's a superhero but she's not very good at it <laughs> that was all I knew um, so that obviously is a terrible pitch for what our show actually is right <laughs> Um, so then I got the sides, which were from our pilot, like a couple of really great scenes with so much subtext, um, really uh, fantastically written, and just so many layers. And I was like, oh, what is this? She was drunk, she was vulnerable, she was tough, she was a little bit sexy and mysterious, um, and I was very intrigued from that. So I did my audition, um, and then kind of didn't hear anything for a minute. And then I got a call saying I was in the mix, and then I went and met with Melissa and Jeff Loeb, who's the head of Marvel. And um, Melissa talked about the, the show like this great psychological character-driven drama, like Homeland or Dexter, and I was like, where do I sign? Give it to me. Um, and, and here we are. Well, on that note, I am wondering, Melissa, the, the way you came up with this show was you developed it starting back in 2010, right? Like eight years ago. So you certainly didn't pitch it as she's a superhero, but like bad at it. <laughs> how did. You did? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't assume, but how did you pitch it? And how did it, you know, why, why did it take so long for it to land somewhere in, in your opinion? Well, it started, uh, we had sold it to ABC Network, and uh, I was like, you sure you want to do this? Because it's really dark, and I'm not going to lighten it up. And they're like, oh, no, 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 we want that. And then I delivered the script, and I'm like, gosh, it's really dark. <laughs> so I did, you know, useless things like, well, the, you know, in the, in the description, the awning is a cheery bright red. It's like, <laughs> didn't fool anybody. The skies uh, are blue. The skies are super blue. Birds are chirping, um, yeah. Yeah, but it was clearly just not a good match for an ABC, ABC network. And, uh, and then Jeff Loeb sort of took it and, you know, cre after every, couple of, every couple of months he'd call and he'd say, what do you, are you available? What do you, because something's happening. Okay, I'll get back to you. And then like four months would go by and he'd call again. He's like, what are you doing now? Are you available? And this was going on for like two years. And then finally he, uh, he's like, oh, we're doing it at Netflix. I'm like, okay. Sure. That's how my audition process, did. well, it felt like two years. It wasn't really two years. It was just two months. But um, it was like, oh, you're in the mix. And then nothing. 
and then I have a meeting and then nothing. And then I do my screen test and then nothing. And then finally screen test again. And then they finally gave it to me. <laughs> Just handed it to you. <laughs> we had to do our doodle adjustment. She was like our, the first person we saw. She was always at the top of the list. But it's kind of like, well, you can't cast your lead and first pop out. So we were, you know, we. Well, clearly that's not people. true. You can. <laughs> you can. Here I am. You can. <laughs> we should have saved yeah. ourselves a lot of time and energy. But we all, it was like sort of thing you have to like try everything and then kind of come back what you already knew. It was really. Uh, I want to toss in an audience question at this point, which is for both of you, what do you think was the turning point in your career? Was it this? Was it something else? What has a what turn, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think there there are there are a bunch. You know, you look at it like like a long career with or like a belt with notches on it, right? Um, don't trust the B. Uh, Breaking Bad was a big one for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, give it up. <laughs> which then, you know, led to the industry sort of seeing me in a different way. And then Don't Trust the Bee was a big one for me. Um, even, you know, the show was for, but when it was canceled, that, that got me like a development deal. And then obviously Jessica Jones. So there's, it's just like a progression and sort of a, a long haul journey. Yeah. And Melissa, same question for you, I guess, from a different point of view. But when did you feel like? your career had reached a turning point or a milestone? Well, I think uh, my, the first movie I got made, Step Up, and then um, it, Dexter was a big turning point, and um, the, the Twilight movies. I haven't Twilight heard of those. Were, were, they, <laughs> were they big? <laughs> yeah, what, they, what those gave me was uh, opportunities, and they gave me the opportunity to do Jessica. So, uh, and then Jessica is kind of the high point, really. Mm -hmm. Now, you guys were searching for the right Jessica for several months there. Like you said, it felt like two years. What about, this might be an awkward question because she's in the room. What about Kristen <laughs> made her the right choice at the time? Well, the reason she was always at the top of the list was because of her ability with her, her comedic abilities, honestly. That was, that was the first, because Jessica, you, you know, this character goes, runs a gamut in terms of emotions, but I think the hardest thing, comedy is the hardest thing. You know, dying is easy, comedy is hard. And to be able to, to get those dramatic moments and then be able to hit those, you know, and that was one of the most important things to me. And, uh, and so I'd seen that, but then I'd also, and I'd seen you in, in The Bee, and my husband actually directed in the B, so he was influential in my paying attention. And um, thank God for Lev. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I saw Breaking Bad. And I was like, "Wow, okay, there's the gamut. You know, there's there's the range right there that I need." And, and for Jessica Jones, and it's a really hard uh, needle to thread. Yeah, you certainly have covered the spectrum or, or the, the ends of the spectrum in your work uh, throughout your career, Kristen. So I am wondering, looking back on these two seasons that you've, uh, you've done as Jessica Jones, what types of scenes are you maybe wary of that when you read them in the script, you, you feel, oh, this is going to be a challenge? Honestly, I'm so fortunate that I get to feel that with a lot of scenes. Um, that is the best part of this job is I, I'm not just one thing. I'm not just funny, or I'm not just doing drama. I'm not just this. Um, Jessica is everything. Uh, and that's what I relish so much about, about this character, and I feel so grateful to have this kind of role that challenges me and allows me to grow and really work on my craft. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time working on these episodes and breaking them down. I spend a lot of time by myself. I prep like crazy so that when I get to set, I am free to let something great happen. Um, and, and that's a, that's a luxury and, and it doesn't happen every day that you get a part like this. Yeah. That ties into an audience question, actually. Right. Uh, how specifically, oh, do you follow any special prep, uh, for the highly emotional scenes? Yeah, I do a little bit of everything, you know, um, for highly emotional scenes, I, I, I try to always use myself as a way in and use my feelings to connect to something, but then I'll as if things, I'll use substitutions um, on the day, I'll prep like crazy, think about it, and kind of like mark it. And then on the day, I'll see the space, not totally know what I want to do, have an idea, and then um, kind of prep everybody in advance. Like, I'll talk to the director, I'll talk to the first AD, like, this is what I'm going to need for this scene. I'll talk to the sound department if I plan on, like, going really, like, full volume. 
um, and just then like make sure that the the set feels safe and just go for it and crack yourself open. The great thing about our set um, is very warm and welcoming, and so I feel safe, so I can really like really go there. Uh, I'm curious about the same thing for for you, for Melissa. Just in the writer's room, what type of scenes challenge you the most to break? Is it sort of the, the same thing where it's you like you like more challenging, more emotional, more heavier scenes? Um, I, I'm really the same, and just lo you know, love running the gamut. Um, you know, always looking for the depth and, of character. Um, you know, the blank board is the hardest thing to face. It's it doesn't matter what scene. It's just starting with what are we doing what story are we telling today it's like oh my god um, that's where the heavy lifting is and then it's just like every scene about how can i push how can i push ritter to you know in how can i push this character into a new place what can i give her you know i, I gotta keep her interested <laughs> <laughs> you're very good at that <laughs> so sort of what you know what have we seen too much or let's, where, where can, what is the new color on this character and you know but always organic always born out of of um you know a, an authentic place and this is an audience question that ties into that can you speak about your process for developing the storylines for for this season specifically thinking about jessica's mother thinking about when to bring david tennant back i'm elaborating on your question whoever asked this um <laughs> But yeah, is there any anything specific for this season? You know, um, we knew, we learned very quickly that the, this is, the stories really only play if they're really personal to Jessica. You know, if they're, it's, it's like, if she just has to save the world, it's like, that's, you know, I mean, one, that's the stuff of the movies, but it's just, it's such a character-driven drama that it, it has to access the character's emotional stakes. And so we, that's really where we start from day one is what journey, what emotional journey do we want to take Jessica on? Where do we want to begin her? Where do we want to land her? And it just, uh, in the case of this season, it really um, lent itself, it, it felt like a really natural place to go, to go, you know, first season was about exploring the Kilgrave trauma, and then it was about uh, sort of going even deeper to the original trauma of having lost her family. Uh, so, and that just, it all kind of came out of that. And now everyone in here just watched the episode in which Kilgrave came back. Kristen, for you, what was it like having David back on set yeah. and then for and then getting into Jessica's headspace opposite Kilgrave once again? You know, it's interesting. A, a lot of people have asked me that and Kilgrave is always in my performance. So for me, he wasn't just back in episode 11. I know he was for everyone else and all my questions are like, oh, what was it like? I'm like, well, he was never gone. He's always, I'm always like using that in my subtext quite a bit, and I built him in. Having him back on set was like doing a victory lap, right? Because his character was so amazing in season one. He was so well received, and, and we had such a great time together. So having him back was off, off camera, like a party. <laughs> um, but I, I love working opposite David. He gives me so much. Um, he's just a strong scene partner, very generous with his energy. Um, you're only as good as your scene partner, so that's like a, you know, your, your, your tennis partner. And Melissa, <laughs> what is your response to the fans who are really, really excited for Kilgrave to come back? Or, well, before season two debuted, they were so excited to see him come back. They wanted him in season two. How do you feel about that response? I, I love it. I'm as excited as they are, so I'm, I'm, I'm as big a fan. So, <laughs> Well, then, on a, on a separate note, um, this season... Uh, you had female directors in every episode. Now, we've talked about this before. Uh, yeah. You are. <laughs> you are one of the few series to do that. This is something innovative, and this is something down the line you've said before that you hope isn't you know, a topic to be brought up at a panel or something like this. But uh, yeah, talk a little bit about your thinking uh, behind that and why it's so important for a show like this to have a female director. Well, in terms of, uh, of it, hoping it not become a topic, meaning meaning that we hope it's going to become such a such a commonplace thing that it no longer is the subject of of you, you know whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I lost a word there. Um, so I mean, for us, it was just a very natural thing. I mean, I we we went into season two going, I want at least half of the directors to be. Uh, women and people of color and you know because it, it's been the industry is as we know from the numbers is all very heavily white male and it's just you know our cast is diverse our stories are diverse and it just feels like you know it's an inclusive show 
so it just was a natural place. And then as we began to book these directors, it was very clear there's a very deep bench of pros. There's not guys out there discovering anyone. These people have, you know, absolutely every bit as, as skilled and, and with as many sexy credits as any of the other folks. So, um, you know, it just sort of lent itself and we went, hey, let's just do all 13. And it became normalized very, very quickly. Yeah. And Kristen, I wonder for you, did the experience feel any different? It did get, it did feel normalized very quickly. And I am in a rare position where most of the people I've worked with have been women in my career. I've worked with mostly female showrunners, a lot of female directors. I know that's not everybody's story. Um, so I didn't think about it as much. I didn't really think about the gender of my director. I do think that um, you can have very frank, raw, vulner vulnerable conversations very quickly with another woman. Oh, you want to see this this part, part of my butt? Okay, fine. Oh, get to, you just get to the point. It's quick. You're in and out. Um, so that was a benefit uh, in dealing with some subject matter that we cover in the show. I really, I really enjoyed having women to the, there to talk to. Yeah, I was uh, I was talking to Carrie Ann Moss a while back, and she she pointed out that you've worked with more female directors yeah. than she has ever had uh, yeah. in her career. So it's very interesting to see. But uh, pivoting from that, some of the darker material on this show. Now, when I've been on set, not, when I've been on set, you have been on set. I've been on set. <laughs> <laughs> I see that you can flip between Jessica and yourself pretty yeah. pretty fluidly. What is the trick to that? Time and preparation. Um, because I do so much prep work um, and have been playing the character for a longer period of time, you get better at it. It's like a muscle. Um, in season one, I wasn't able to do it as as easily. I would kind of thought I would like get into Jessica's headspace and stay there, but that didn't work very well. I got so depressed. Um, it was it was really difficult. So so now what I do is you know I just I prep like crazy, and you know like when you're doing anything, when you're like have a test coming up the more you study the less nervous you are the more prepared you are the better you do it's like that with my with my work and so I prep like crazy I do my homework so that when I get on set I know what I'm doing I don't even have to look at the call sheet like oh we're doing that scene right I know it I know my lines that way when I'm on set I can go in and out of it um and that keeps me balanced it helps me you know not get the blues yeah absolutely don't don't get depressed yeah. <laughs> Um, now, Melissa, how did you, this is going way back to season one, how did you build your writer's room for a show like this, something that would go into the tough territory like that? Who did you look for? Always looking for character-driven writers, you know, always uh, for people with edge um, and for people who have been on uh, shows that have pushed the edge so they're used to sort of working, coloring outside the lines and um, you know, it's it's and it always want a very balanced room with gender, uh, with orientation, with with race. You you want a really representative room because it doesn't it doesn't mean no good to have you know all middle aged white women <laughs> there. It's like I know what that experience is. I'm looking for other people. So I'm I'm when I talk to a writer, I all my question is always you know what's your story? And if their story is they're raised in Orange County and their parents are still together and they're like have a really happy life, I'm like. <laughs> yeah. Basically, tell me your pain. I want your pain. And have you lived? Yeah. yeah. Have, you, have you lived? <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, looking at another audience question for you guys. Uh, Kristen, Jessica uh, has, <laughs> has a really emotionally taxing season in season two. Yeah. Do you see her evolving moving forward? It, it, is she, it seems like she's dealing with her demons better. You know, yeah. Um, Yes, I've been thinking about it a lot because we're, you know, gearing up for season three mm -hmm. and thinking about where she is. There were a few defining moments, I think, in season two. One in the episode we just saw where she is faced with Kilgrave at the end and says, I'm not like you. That makes me more powerful than you ever were. That's a big moment for Jessica Jones. Um, she hates herself. She thinks she's a monster. And so for her to have that moment where she realizes she's good, I think that's going to be a big thing for Jessica moving forward. Um, I don't think it's going to be like a leap, but I think it's a step in the right direction. Um, so, so yeah, I think uh, what I loved about season one and season two, how we've really looked back and fixed some stuff and faced some things, what happens next? And I'm, I'm excited to see that. Yeah. One of the critical questions that I think, Melissa, you've been asked a lot over, over time is how you top Kilgrave. And this season you see, I mean, you guys just saw in this episode, 
I was about to say Kristen's mother. <laughs> Jessica's mom is formidable, is, uh, is also monstrous in many ways. How did you come up with her? And when you thought about topping someone like Kilgrave, you know, what were your goals? Right. Well, first of all, I, I wasn't going to top Kilgrave. You know, that's, that Kilgrave was, you know, drop the mic and walk out. Yeah. And, you know, so... <laughs> The objective was to not even try. You know, it's like Kilgrave's set the bar incredibly high over here, so we're just going to set the bar over here, a different bar altogether. And um, so it was a very different kind of storytelling, you know, of that sort of, uh, it was a much slower build, and our our uh, villain was really not, uh, was on occasion, occasionally not. I mean, it was, you know, much more complex uh, questions in it. And... You know, so that was, it was just really completely doing something different, and we'll do something different again season three. Because, I mean, you've got to keep it interesting. <laughs> right, exactly. You can't bore Kristen. <laughs> yeah. God forbid. <laughs> uh, well, then, Melissa, another question for you. We were kind of talking about this backstage, but superheroes, this genre, Marvel, has pretty much taken over everything just about right uh when you started on this back in 2010 that wasn't the case and over time it's become the case so how has working on this show affected the way you view the superhero landscape uh and yeah let's jump off that well you know we i have always approached the show all of us have always approached the show um in a very different way than any of the other Marvel shows or movies which is not a comic book i mean we've approached it as a character driven drama so uh, and that goes into, uh, in terms of the photography, in terms of the acting actors that we cast and, and how they play it. And, you know, Ritter sets the, the tone. Just She's very, very naturalistic. And so that's very much the tone of, of, uh, of the entire series. So it's really, um, it's, it's, it's very different, I think, than anything else Marvel has going. It's just, it's just a separate entity, you know. It's, it's always it, it's a little strange that it's Marvel's Jessica Jones, and I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. Um, they're very good partners to us, very very good. But it's a different, it's a different animal. It doesn't hurt to be under the Marvel umbrella because they're huge. You have an audience yeah. day one, which is hard to come by these days. You know, when I, when I was first, you know, getting involved with the project, it felt like the kind of material that you would find in an independent movie where you made $40 a day and would never be seen. Um, like that juicy stuff that you die to do as an actor. Um, but then, you know, it's got the Marvel logo in front of it and it has a global audience. So it's, it's a, an amazing thing um, that we get to be uh, in this universe, but in like the sort of dark misfit corner. <laughs> I like that. The dark misfit corner. Yeah, that's where we live. <laughs> that's like where you'll find us. That area. It's like the Lion King, the shadowy place. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, similar question. This is great. And, and they've, they've been incredibly <laughs> supportive of us just kind of going off and doing, I mean, you know, just supporting us in the, in the vision and the, what we do together. And, you know, it's been really great. Mm -hmm. Now, similar question, Kristen, for you. How has seeing that this role uh, could be so complex affected the way you look at the other roles that are being offered to you? The other yeah, she's a there. tough act to follow, you know. Um, it's it, it, it's tough because the scripts that I get for Jessica Jones are so great. So then when I get something that's not great, I'm like, what is this? Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, and that happens a lot. There's a, there's a lot of material out there that's not, that's not on this level, um, which is why I'm so grateful to do it. I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about your filming schedule, though, as as Jessica. You're you're pretty much on every page of the script. Mm -hmm. I remember when you were talking about the Defenders, it was like you were relieved because you weren't on every <laughs> single page. Yeah, just talk about what it was like in season one to be in pretty much every scene, and then in season two to have yeah. a little more room. Yeah. So um, you know, this gig is full immersion. I'm not. I don't. I don't need to have like a bunch of days off. What am I gonna do? I'm like there to work and there to do, to there to do my job. Like I've always said, like, you know, like sitcoms for example, they work from nine to twelve every day. I'm like, well, what do you do for the rest of the day? No, seriously, what do you do? Do you like, <laughs> like do other things? Uh, so um, I the full immersion of this gig. Um, it, it, it all lends itself to the work. You know, if, if I'm tired, I put it into the work. If I'm, we're doing a night shoot, so the next day I can't get turned around, it all, everything goes into the work. The frustration, all of it goes into the work. Um, and, and so all of the elements are, are make the final product. Was there, can you think of a scene this season or maybe even in this episode that you were really wary of uh, just because of how much work you had to put into it? 
honestly, all of the episodes are pretty big for me, and I, there's a lot of a lot of work. Um, uh, I think the the biggest one is probably in episode 13. I don't know if any everyone has seen the show, but the the ending <laughs> uh, of the Cover show your ears. <laughs> of the sh- of the show was was a pretty heavy workload for me, and I I knew that was coming. I, I thought about it for like two weeks in advance. Like, oh, we have to make sure on the on this day we do it like this. Okay, remember what I said. Like all that day, we have to make sure what you know things like that. Because um, I'm always thinking ahead. But I kind of just prep like crazy and then take it one day at a time. Yeah. For scenes like those, how do you how do you know that you've succeeded? Do you ever feel that way? Is there you know you do a take and you're like, yes, I did it. Is there a <laughs> nailed it a feeling? Yeah. How do you know? Uh, you know. You know, you just know, you know, yeah, I guess it, if, if you've done all your work and you do your best, you know. You just know, yeah. So then you yelled, nailed it on set. I was like, oh, I guess you nailed it. No. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've really never, ever worked with a, a, an actor who's as, as hardworking and does as, as much, has as much craft and is as, as prepared as, as Ritter is. I mean, it's, it's really... It's so funny because she comes, she makes it look so easy, and then she's like, uh, "Yeah, no, I just spent you know 24 hours doing," it. <laughs> and it's like that's really what it what it's about is is you know she does all this work and then just I mean she'll nail it in often one take, but you know three at most, yeah. and uh, it's a, it's an extraordinary thing, and everyone's like, "Wow, she's really just nailed." It's like well, it's because she works her <laughs> ass off on this stuff. I remember on episode seven, we did a flashback episode and you were like, oh, your walk is different. I'm like, yeah, I've been working on it for two weeks. <laughs> yeah. She, her whole physicality changes. I mean, her voice drop. you know, this, this yeah. is her normal voice and with Jessica, it drops a notch and she has a different walk. And then, yeah, when we did the flashback to when she was in her early twenties, she had a, a buoyancy and, and that was like, Oh, are you doing it on purpose? No, clearly, because <laughs> it always feels so natural. I'm like, oh, you know. You know, I've been I've been um, an actress for a long time, and I feel I work this hard because I feel grateful to have the opportunity to work this hard. Parts like this don't come around very often, you know. And I work hard on all my parts, but I've I think I joined SAG in 1999, and you know it doesn't happen overnight. And when it comes, you know how special it is. Well, actually, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Now I'm curious, how did you get your SAD card? Um, a commercial. Uh, I think I at that point I was like an extra in a lot of commercials, and I think in the third one you become a must join. Um, so I was a I was an extra. That's how I joined. Got it. <laughs> Yay! Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> you mentioned your voice earlier. Uh, I am curious, how did you find the right tonality for Jessica going in way back when? Yeah, I spent a lot of time by myself and sort of. So Jessica has had so much trauma happen to her. She has so much weight on her shoulders, the weight of the world, the the tremendous loss and grief that she carries around. So that is heavy, right? So I just like worked in my body to figure out like where then that emotion lives and you get lower, 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 lower and it's in her gut. So I feel like that's where Jessica operates from where I'm like a little bit more up because I'm adorable. But um, <laughs> she totally is. <laughs> so true. But for Jessica, she's, she's not, you know what I mean? <laughs> no, no, it's she's totally not. different thing. <laughs> Uh, well, Melissa, then I wonder, also going all the way back then, what kind of person did you have in mind? Did you have someone in mind when you were writing the part um, that matched this? <laughs> this. Mean, did, it, it, <laughs> she just fit it so perfectly. I mean, you know, it was. I had the original source material to work off of, but, uh, you know, Ritter really shifted the character. And uh, I mean, after we cast... Ritter, you know, things change in the script as well because it's like you're then you're building it toward uh, someone in particular. Mm-hmm. Now, congratulations on a third season! Uh, yay! Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, Two part question. First one: Season one was so well received, right? Uh, and going into season two, there was I imagine there was a lot of pressure. Going into season three, is there still the same amount of pressure? How much You're pressure always, do you feel? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you always feel pressure just for yourself to try to, you know, always do something new and different and push yourself and challenge yourself even harder uh, to more difficult places. Uh, so, uh, but I also at the same time feel, uh, I'm, I don't know if you, I'm sure you do as well, that, that feeling of 
I know this character. Yeah. You know, and I know this world. And so there's a familiarity with it that, you know, I didn't have in season one. I didn't, I was was still figuring it out and we were still working on it all the way through season one. So by the time we stepped into season two, it was a really, it was, you know, it's always, storytelling is hard, but I knew who she was. You know, I could, Ritter had her embodied. So it's like, okay, now we can go to the next level and, yeah, I feel the same way. We All that time you spend in the beginning, like building everything from the ground up, from the boots up, that's time you get back that you can then go even deeper. And in, in a lot of ways, um, I think things in season two, there are things that are better than season one. Um, I think I got to go much deeper into Jessica. Uh, you know, departments run smoother. There's shorthands with everybody. So in, in a way, it just like gets better and better as it goes along. So in season two, when you received scripts, you didn't have to spend as much time filling in the backstory for her, looking at... Well, there's still a ton of backstory because we're, we're dealing with something that happened in her past. Um, it was just a different kind of thing. So it was like, if, if season one was over here, we get to now like spend more time like in Jessica's heart, really. Season one was so in her head, and it was so psychological, and really about her PTSD. And now season two is about, you know, Jessica didn't have a relationship with her mother. She was never able to define herself in that way and then gets an opportunity to know her mother. And, you know, that's that's a really big, that's a big void and a big hole in her heart that we got to explore. So um, it's still a, quite a bit of <laughs> quite a bit of work. Yeah. When you do receive a script then, how do you tackle it? Oh, I devour it <laughs> like candy. Um, I can't wait to get my scripts. Um, I get it. I read it first. Kind of like... Then I go back through and jot down like ideas that I have and just kind of go off of first instincts and then dig deeper, deeper, deeper. Then Melissa and I do a couple of passes of notes back and forth, um, encouraging each other to go deeper in places, find things that I'm inspired by and love. Um, And it's just a, a great like collaborative process. Now, looking ahead to season three, Melissa, you're going to be asked this a lot going forward, right? But what can you tell us about how you're thinking of where to take Kristen and Jessica? Well, the one thing I could say is, you know, we spent seasons one and two really digging into Jessica's past. And I think uh, I'm I'm really interested in in moving forward. Like, how do you take that, all those experiences and and move? What does that look like? So that's what I'm, I'm, I'm. That's what I'm interested That's in. That's what I'm interested in, too, which yeah. is... And it, it's it's interesting, in season two, before I even started getting the scripts, like, talking about what I was interested in, I was really interested in finding out when and why Jessica lost all of the color. What was that thing that made her the way she is? And that ended up being exactly what Melissa was doing for season two. So, luckily, our brains are, like, yeah. connected. <laughs> Thinking alike. Yeah. What was your reaction to that, actually, the flashback episode? Oh, my God. Well, oh, well I'll <laughs> tell you one thing. Originally, when I read it, I thought maybe they should get another actress to play it because I was like oh she's so young are you going to cast somebody else is the younger actress going to play and they're like no we pay you to do these episodes Um, (laughs) uh, and then it ended up being I think in addition to the episode that we just saw uh, it was my favorite because it was like getting to do something completely new. I got to take the Jessica we know and strip layers back and see like what she would have been like. Um, See her with her young boyfriend. See the origin story of her leather jacket. Yes. Um, (laughs) So uh, it ended up being such a fun experience. I just loved it. And see a music video for Oh My God. Which I hope everyone's seen. Um, It's an earworm. Uh, Now we're going to end on one last audience question, which is what inspirational messages can you give to someone that wants to do what you do or Uh, just follow their dreams in general? No, I think you work hard and you say yes to everything. Like I said, I got my SAG card and what is this, 20 years later? Um, just about just yeah about. and I started out by saying yes to everything creating my own content I had a video camera I wrote little like scenes and scripts and shot them and work begets work you know you never know who you're going to meet on that set of a music video and then or a commercial and, um, and and that's really it's a progression I didn't have something happen overnight and I don't really know a lot of people who have staying power that do So um, you just keep showing up. You keep working hard. It's a 24-hour thing. And if you want it bad enough, I think it'll happen. Well, Melissa, do you have anything to add? 
Uh, it's the same goes for me as well. I mean, I think the I think the uh, other thing is tenacity. You know, right. really learning how. I mean, you know, being able to take a hit. The people who who are making it are those people who you know just pick themselves off the floor and just keep going. I mean, I same thing. I've been working a long time before uh, I'd seen the kind of success that I was hoping for, and it was just years and years of just picking myself up off the floor and saying, you know, today, uh, tomorrow it'll be better. And it, it, it never is, I call it delusional optimism. You have to have it. You know. Yeah, aggressively optimistic. It's yeah. a, that's a really good point, and I think it's something to highlight. You hear no all the time. And it, at a certain point, it's a numbers game, right? If you're on a roller coaster, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, and it goes down. You can't hear no all the time. So every time you hear a no, you have to kind of believe that that means you're one step closer to getting a yes. So... Well put. Uh, we're going to end with that. Thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. Thank you both. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Thanks, Shirley. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.